Hello again and welcome to the Gospel of Mark. I'm Jim Grant and it's a pleasure to be with you again as we continue our study of the favorite gospel, probably not only of the three of us, but of many people who really want to get the very first version of what was the message of the good news of Jesus Christ. My guests today, as each week, are Father Mike Listeri, who is the Director of Worship for the Diocese of Fresno and Pastor of Immaculate Heart Parish in Hanford, California. Also with him every week is Dr. Robert Maldonado, a philosopher at the University of uh, California at Fresno, uh, California State University, Fresno. And Robert and Father Mike have been with us week after week, and today they're going to walk us through Chapter 8 in a gulp. We have a lot to do today, so I wonder if we could see all of chapter 8 in front of us on the screen and have uh, Robert and Father Mike have us appreciate where Mark is leading us passage by passage. So what do we have here, Father Mike? Well, what you begin to see is a lot of signs, miracles, a lot of need, of, if you will, for Mark to bring Jesus a, into a certain light, a light of power. Um, again, we've talked before how those closest to Jesus have serious doubts, uh, who are not quite sure who he is, what he has to offer, what he can do. And now we're beginning to not only see the work he does, but now he's challenging them to who he is. And have they heard, have they seen, and are they willing, once they've heard and seen, to make a commitment? Robert, before we take any particular passage, is there in those first six that were up there on the screen any progression you'd like to walk us through? Any one of those that you want us to look at for a moment? Well, the, one of the things that's happening, is, as Father Mike said, is that there's this kind of crisis in discipleship. And, and in the second half of the gospel, because we're almost at the midpoint of the gospel itself, uh, Jesus is going to start giving a lot of uh, teaching on discipleship, what it means to follow Jesus, and, and, uh, and the, all the conditions of, of following. So the, the second half is, is, uh, is quite important in terms of the teaching that, that comes out uh, through Jesus. Uh, and in terms of the miracles, too, it's quite interesting because at this point, uh, with all the teaching on discipleship, uh, most of the miracles sort of dramatically stop. Uh, after after this chapter, uh, there's only the the boy in the synagogue and uh, uh, blind Bartimaeus in chapter 10, uh, and then the cross, the big miracle. Why don't we look then at chapter 8, verses 11 to 13? The Pharisees seek a sign. Is there anything in those three little lines that you think we'd want to highlight about? why the Pharisees seek a sign, what is this uh, wicked generation, and um, what's going on in those three lines, anything in particular? Well, it's quite abrupt, and you know, the, the Pharisees come, they're clearly cast as a negative character, and, and Jesus doesn't really respond much. He just sort of throws his hands up and leaves and says, they're not going to get a sign. This generation is not going to get a sign. And this is going to be very important later in chapter 13, because the disciples are going to come to Jesus asking for a sign. And it's kind of a, a, a cringe moment because uh, Jesus was so angry uh, when, when the Pharisees came seeking a sign and then his own disciples want to do the same thing. So signs apparently are not proper, uh, according to Mark, uh, at least to ask for them. Now, the next passage is kind of interesting only to me at the moment because I see Pharisees again. This time it's not a sign, but it's leaven. What's going on here, Father Mike and, and Robert, over the discourse on leaven? Uh, bread's a big deal in the New Testament. It's very beautifully used by Mark at this point. Jesus is the one loaf and all of that. Don't you understand? But what's going on right now why is the leaven of the Pharisees to be bewared from? Why do we beware the leaven? Well, again, I think it goes back to when Jesus is preaching both to, to the Jews, the local community, and to Gentiles from the outside, if you will, outside the community, is, is beware where you're hearing, what you're hearing, who's telling it to you, and again, look around you. Look at what I'm saying. 
And leaven, of course, we know that, that it's that ingredient that you need for bread to, to become real. And if you will, uh, there is that sense as, are what they sharing with you real? Is this what you have real? Or do I have something to offer you that is also real or better or more authentic? But this also connects back uh, to chapter 4. Because back in chapter 4, we had the parable of the sower of the seed. Yep. And three of the, 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 the three seeds that don't really survive uh, get interpreted as uh, the scribes and the Pharisees, uh, Peter and the disciples, and Herod and the rich young man. And, and so here you have uh, sort of all three of them. <laughs> you have the Pharisees, you have the disciples, and you have Herod. And so, again, there are three examples of how not to be a disciple that are going to be contrasted with the, with the, uh, the true disciple that Jesus is going to teach about. Also, now, not to miss one point, I, I saw it again, and you know, there's a lot of reference to bread in the last, I mean, the feeding of mm -hmm. the crowds, always having enough bread out of so little. And even in this one begins, they only had only one loaf, Again, they would have been short by what would have been the measure of need, and yet out of that, so much more can be taken. And so you begin to see a theme on that too, constantly where there is so little of the bread, and yet it needs to, to be stretched out to feed. But I think even deeper than that, there is enough if you really seek it and search it and, and, and share it. Mark's actually great here because <laughs> the... Uh, the uh, disciples in 16 are going to say, we have no bread. And Mark introduces it in 14. They'd forgotten to bring bread, <laughs> and they had only one loaf with them in the bread, in, in the boat. And, of course, the loaf is Jesus, right? It's, it's no bread. Uh, they, they don't have bread, and they don't even quite correlate that they have bread because Jesus is with them. And then what must be so frustrating to a good teacher, such as Jesus is, in which he'll be called teacher several times at this point, he says this to them, why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? And that idea of a hard heart goes back to the Pharaoh, goes back to the people of Israel that over the many, many prophets, hard hearts, non-comprehending minds. And then he closes it in 21. Do you not yet understand? Robert, you're a professor. How is the frustration level in <laughs> Jesus like what one would be saying, don't you get it yet? Well, I think that's <laughs> exactly <laughs> what it must be like. Uh, uh, they don't, and they, they're not using their faculties, right? Uh, they can't see, they can't hear, they can't remember. Uh, they don't remember just a few chapters back, he multiplied the loaves. Uh, they don't remember back to chapter 4 when they were supposed to understand the parables uh, and they need to. And again, this, this as a teaching example though, again, I think it's really important, you know, we've been emphasizing how negative the, some of these characters are because they are, uh, but that also serves a teaching purpose, you know, to, to give a negative example uh, implies that there is a positive too. There is some kind of alternative that's present that needs to be understood and, and of course, uh, insofar as we see them, that puts, uh, see, see the disciples as not getting it, or Jesus being uh, short, that puts it back on us. We have to, we have to understand. We, we should not be like this. <laughs> um. Moving on, the next story is perfectly placed. It's hard to say just the genius of, of the editing skill of Mark, but let's give him credit here. The blind man at Bethsaida. Why don't we read it and then work with it. Father Mike, you want to read us that text? Sure. And they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands upon him, he asked him, Do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see men, but they look like trees walking. And again, he laid his uh, hands upon his eyes, and he looked intently and was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And he sent him away to his home, saying, Do not even enter the village. Awesome story. Robert, what's the first thing you need to tell us? Well, the first thing is that this is only in Mark. 
uh, so it's one of the rare stories. There's, there's actually not much of Mark that is a whole story that's only in Mark. Uh, it's usually at the level of phrases or, or words that are unique to Mark. Uh, and, and so since Mark is likely first, that means that Matthew and Luke probably did not like this story because <laughs> they left it out. Uh, and, and so the, uh, the, the second thing then I would say is that there are many odd things about this story. Uh, Jesus takes two times to heal the man. Uh, there's no explanation of Jesus' inability to, or the two-stageness of it. Uh, was he not able? Was the, did the man not have sufficient faith? The story actually just doesn't say, and so it, it just leaves it, uh, it, leaves it open. Uh, there's also a number of other just strange details. Uh, he takes him out of the village. He tells him to go home, but not to return to the village. So there's uh, sort of a geographic movement here. Uh, and then, of course, the weird miracle, right? He, he sees uh, people, but they look like trees walking. It's very awkward in the Greek. Uh, the syntax is odd, uh, and, and it's odd in its content as well. Uh, some of my students often ask, how would he even know what trees look like? Uh, but the story doesn't indicate that he was yeah. necessarily born blind. Uh, and and yeah. I often say that, you know, in the, at, at the fair, you go to the fun house, and there's a fun house mirror. Uh, I often think of it that way, where you, know, you can look short and fat or tall and skinny. Uh, I, I would say this is one of the tall and skinny <laughs> examples. Uh, <laughs> so that what's, whatever is going on, uh, ants or something, uh, the, uh, he's not seeing clearly, because the second time it says he sees clearly. And so his perspective is off. They're out of proportion. They're too tall and, and, and not like people. Father Mike, on the other hand, there is a, a real, I, I guess, symbolic quality, I would think, that make this story in the two-phased healing actually um, brilliant for the idea of how the disciples, they almost sometimes kind of maybe get it, but, but not really. They're like men like trees walking. Uh, do you see anything that gives this also a, a real um, clarity in that the healing is also just extraordinary? It's extraordinary, but it doesn't necessarily have to be immediate because faith is not always immediate for most people. I mean, it's like uh, Robert mentioned earlier as a teacher who has to teach and you're hoping your students pick it up and you, you, know, you need to repeat. As a pastor and certainly as a homilist and you know, the cycle for years and years and years and you get these readings come up, people don't catch them. They don't catch them very well. If they do, they've got them. And what's more important is it takes time to develop faith. It, it's not, you know, we're so used to it in this technological era that uh, I remember uh, growing up when I turned on the TV set, you had to let it warm up before the picture came. It wasn't instant. Today, everything is instant. We have our iPads and our iPhones. And so it's a way of saying faith takes time. It may not be immediate for us, and it was not going to be immediate for the apostles. And so the first phase, if you will, the first action didn't quite take. Um, the second one did. Uh, it wasn't going to be easy. It's never easy. Jesus knew that, I think, and uh, certainly having been surrounded by these men for some time. And I think it's the same thing for us. It isn't always instant, and we're used to instantaneous. It's even more odd for us today than we would have been for people before. But people like power to be instant. People want it to happen immediately. And again, having been a person who's been around, a lot of people have experienced miracles, especially been to miracles, it's Fatima and so on. Uh, the miracle isn't always the physical curing, more than maybe the spiritual curing, and the physical may follow later. So maybe it was this, it was this there's a spiritual into it to a physical into it or whatever, but um, it maybe takes a couple tries before the message gets through. You know, we have to take our break at this very moment, but don't worry, we'll be right back, and we're going to find out just how right Father Mike is when we have Peter and Jesus go at it at Caesarea Philippi. Stay tuned. Yeah. 
KNXC thanks all its loyal viewers and respected businesses who have supported your Catholic television station. Now you can support KNXT with program underwriting by having your name, your company's name, or organization associated with your favorite program. Detailed information about you or your company will appear before and after each program or day part you select. Keep the quality and spiritual message alive and make a difference. Call 559-488-7440 today or go online at knxt.tv to find out more about program underwriting on KNXT. Welcome back to the Gospel of Mark. You know, we're not only in the middle of the show, we're almost at the middle of the Gospel. We're, we're at a very, very exciting part. I just can't wait. Uh, Robert, could you pick up where we did leave off, and you may want to even tell us how you would rephrase this pericope, 8, 27 to 33. How do you see what's going on and then read it to us? Well, this passage is commonly referred to as the Confession of Peter at Caesarea Philippi, and I think that fits Matthew's version quite well, but not so well with Mark. I tend to think of this more as a confrontation between Jesus and Peter, uh, and, and they sort of actually kind of get into it. Uh, so shall I read it? Uh, and Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say, Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly, and Peter took him and began to rebuke Jesus. But turning and seeing his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, for you are not on the side of God, but of people. Yeah, that doesn't sound like the handing on of the keys. Uh, it's, a, <laughs> it's another narrative. So Robert, why don't you help us see why Mark and Matthew might be on, on different wavelengths with this uh, similar um, uh, experience of Jesus and Peter. Well, Mark sets it up uh, first with the on the way. So they're on the way uh, to Caesarea Philippi, which is outside of Israel. So we're in pagan territory here. And remember in Mark, the way refers to the way of following Jesus also. So it, it's the path, it's the road, but it's also this path of discipleship. And, and Jesus asked this question. The first clue that is that Peter seems to get it right, and yeah. Peter hasn't gotten much right to no. this point. No. Uh, so as readers, we're a little surprised because we would expect Peter to get it wrong, maybe. Uh, <laughs> yeah. and, and the second clue is what Jesus does in response to Peter getting it right. Uh, the verb that's there that I, I read as he charged them to tell no one about him is a verb that up until this point has only been used against demons. Uh, it's the rebuke word. Oh, it's, uh, and so Jesus rebukes him, uh, them. Uh, and it's, it's almost as if, what's going on? Why is Jesus using a, an exorcism word here? Uh, and, and then uh, he moves into this prediction of his, of his passion. So it's quite a startling moment in the, in the, in the gospel because, and again, as, as readers, remember Mark told us that Jesus was the Christ at the very beginning and of the gospel. And so in, in the narrative world of Mark, when Peter says, you are the Christ, we think he's right. Uh, and, and, and then Jesus treats him as if he's, he's possessed uh, before the next episode the, the, where they continue that. Which it really gets, it just gets better. Yeah, because then Peter uses the same word, right? He, he rebukes Jesus. And so then Peter is treating Jesus as if he's got some kind of demonic spirit. And then, and then Jesus again rebukes him and actually calls him Satan, which is pretty harsh uh, and I mean. demonic. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite extraordinary. The other thing that's, that's happening here, too, is this is setting up a pattern that's quite peculiar to Mark in the second half. Uh, there are three passion predictions that are going to happen in chapter 8 here. 9 and 10, and each of these passion predictions uh, 
have this exact same pattern uh, literarily. So Jesus predicts his passion, suffering, death, and resurrection. That's followed immediately by a negative reaction on the part of the disciples. Uh, and then the negative reaction on the part of the disciples provides Jesus with an opportunity then to give some positive teaching on what true, true discipleship and following Jesus is. Uh, and that happens three times. So each of those, my teacher used to call this the triple-triple because it was a triple pattern that happens three times. So it's not just in basketball. So the triple-triple, uh, it's not a Rajan Rondo thing right now. <laughs> it's more of a thing of these three predictions, which come in three segments. Um, we're going to see them again in the next two chapters. Mm -hmm. So if you thought that was interesting, know that Mark likes it enough to do it again. Father Mike, um, Robert gave us uh, such an in-depth look at those uh, verses. Is there something else that you'd like to find in them that lets us see something else that you know um, is also there that we don't want to miss well, either? I, I just like going back to, to what Robert said and I think continues. On, what, they're on their way. There's a journey. But you kind of wonder, are there two paths going on down the road? There's the path of Jesus. There's the path of the disciples. They each think they're on a path, but they're not necessarily walking the same path. And so Peter and the apostles nearest, uh, are they looking at a path of power? Are they looking at some other kind of whatever it is, the ends they see, different than what Jesus, the, his particular ends? And so the way may be walking down a physical path, but are they really walking two different paths? And that's where the conflict comes in because Jesus has got one idea, one agenda, where the apostles have another agenda, and the agenda keep coming back at each other. So, like so many of us who are always think we're together, we're really not. And individuals have their agendas. And I see, think these, three, these two strong individuals are not necessarily walking arm in arm, though they are walking together. That's a really good image. Um, it, I think you're right, too, with the, the power issue, because when, when Peter treats Jesus as if he's possessed, you know, Jesus has just predicted his passion, his suffering, death, and resurrection, uh, which you would think would be fairly momentous. You would think. And then Peter turns around and rebukes him. It, Mark, unlike Matthew, doesn't give any content to, the, to the, what Peter says. And so all we can do is infer, and, and the only inference I could make is Peter is saying, no, Jesus, that's not the kind of Christ you are. The Christ isn't going to suffer and die. Uh, so Peter seems to want no suffering, at least in his Christ, because if Christ suffers, then Peter might have to too, right? And, and so, uh, uh, and then of course the teaching that, you, so that's the negative reaction I referred to, Peter treating Jesus that way, and then uh, the teaching that follows is to take up the cross to follow. And so Jesus, to take up a cross is explicitly to accept uh, the condition of suffering as what it means to follow. You know, one thing that struck me only because I read this at a reading, at a, at a liturgy, is from the letter of Peter, the first letter of Peter. There is a passage that shows that maybe in later time, Peter came to his senses. And here's what he says in the beautiful letter, chapter 4. Verse 13, Beloved, do not be surprised that a trial by fire is occurring among you as if something strange were happening to you, but rejoice to the extent that you share in the sufferings of Christ so that when his glory is revealed, you may also rejoice exultantly. Such an interesting thing to find at this point in my life, a letter that I had probably never read much from First Peter to find it getting back to possibly uh, a conversion in Peter's own spirituality. Mm -hmm. Picking up, why don't we look at briefly the conditions of discipleship. What's there for us, fellas? Well, again, discipleship calls for commitment. It calls for, again, going back, uh, what is, what are the, what's the end of this commitment? If I, if I join something, if I join up, what are you asking from me? Even though Jesus keeps putting it out, doesn't, there's not obviously a receptive ear on the other side. But discipleship means commitment. Commitment means uh, going all the way. And going all the way means taking risks that you rather not take um, sometimes. 
And I think certainly there is that probability now. It says, now what do we do? You've heard that we've had the debate. Are you going to join? Are you going to take on this discipleship? Are you ready to commit? Are you ready to go that extra mile, which may cost you your life? Let's go to the passage that we will be concluding our program with, the Transfiguration. I'll read it briefly and let Father Mike and Robert give us a final thought. We have like three minutes. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his garments became glistening, intensely white as no fuller on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah and Moses. And they were talking to Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is well that we are here. Let us make three booths, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were exceedingly afraid. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came down from heaven, from a cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly looking around, they, saw, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. One minute. What can we say, Father Mike? Well, this is a resurrection story. See notes, but I remember Father Ippoli when I took uh, this uh, class from him at the Josephinum. And he really firmly believed this was a resurrection story. It was brought in by Mark at this particular event to talk about what not only would happen, but did happen. And as one of those references, and one kind of, kind of looks at it from that angle, uh, the moment of power, the moment of glory, the moment of what happens when you do commit. Robert. Well, I, I think that's, that's right as well. Uh, again, interesting mark and features, uh, continuing the negativity. Peter, uh, you know, <laughs> no. I, I don't know. Jesus is there talking with uh, Moses and Elijah, and, and Peter interrupts him to say, uh, it's good you're here. <laughs> um, uh, and then Mark tells us that he, did, he said that because he didn't know what to say. So uh, it's, it's interesting in terms of that, that kind of thing. It also connects to the end of the gospel with the women being afraid, they're afraid. So that kind of resurrection element is certainly uh, present here. You know, we've gotten to the end of our program today. Um, we want to thank uh, Father Mike Lestieri and Dr. Robert Maldonado for how they have shared with us the depths of Chapter 8. It is rich. We hope that you'll be back again next week as we go into chapter 9, knowing that all of this that we're sharing week after week is our effort to uh, share with you our own excitement at reading the good news of Mark for our lives today. Till next week, God bless. Mm -hmm.